so um, what I'm going to talk about is adventures in dependencies and deployment management. Because yeah, I mean, this is this is Perl, so you know, Perl 5 is just a virtual machine. CPAD is the language. And CPAD is a wonderful thing, right up until you realize that you're now trying to maintain a compatible set of versions across a couple of hundred dependencies. Then things get interesting. Um, and I've, I've spent a lot of time acting, a, de acting as deployment specialist at Shadowcat, so designing and redesigning various versions of this stuff. Um, back before that, though, I started off um, doing systems automation and ISP, uh, which was kind of good fun, in that we had sort of 30,000 or so domains, business to business, email, web, various other stuff attached. Um, so the initial approach to that was, well, okay, we'll bulk build. Uh, when I first got there, the uh, mail servers worked by, you generated the master.palswd file on the primary mail server, and then kicked it to rebuild the .db files, because it was BSDI. There's probably at least two of you who remember BSDI. Uh, <laughs> um, and also generating httpd.com from various other things. Which is, I mean, it works, but it doesn't do very well on granularity. So over time, we transitioned to um, an approach using putting all of the user information in LDAP, uh, which obviously was much nicer, uh, right up until the point where we tried to implement SUEXAC. Because SUEXAC, you can only set the user one of two ways either by user foo in a virtual host block or via more user there. Now, user foo is fine except this was Apache 1.3. Apache 1.3 generates a virtual host definition by copying the struct for the entire server definition and then pokes in the virtual host settings. So your memory, your memory usage over having no virtual host basically increases linearly. If you're running on Solaris, which will not overcommit memory, this means that when your Apache boots, it tries to allocate four gigabytes of swap all at once, and the machine wedges for 45 minutes. This was not amazingly useful, let us say. Um, so the, the solution to this was, oh, what about this tilde food then? So, break out more rewrite, because what could possibly go wrong? And what you do is when you get a request for domain.com that's going to need to hit the CGI bin, you rewrite it internally to slash tilde domain.com and then alias domain.com to their primary FTP user in LDAP. And then the CGI one is the right user. This was in production for several years and I'm not sure whether I'm proud or scared of it, probably both. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Um, but one, one of the things that I, I got into at, at the time was um, a model of automation which is very, rather than having add, update and delete, always work on the principle of ensure and revoke. So you're either saying this should be there in exactly this state or this should not be there at all. Um, and working on that basis means basically you're trying to converge towards a correct configuration. Um, and ensure and revoke can both be modeled to be eigenpotent, uh, which gives you a lot of freedom to handle things. But it requires carefully designed infrastructure. Uh, and no, I do not consider that Apache config to count as careful or designed. But I did figure it out in the last 48 hours before go live because my beloved systems team hadn't actually tested the web servers. Anyway. Um, <laughs> It, 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 took, it took me several years to recover my faith in the existence of systems administrators that I actually liked, but that's a different story. Um, so I, I, I've been wondering for years about sort of how do you generalize this stuff? Um, and the, the answer is, it's sort of possible. I mean, if, if you look at things like um, CF Engine for all its faults tries to converge towards a desired state. Um, but then I, I, I got distracted because, you know, Shadowcat, we're a consultancy. We get brought on project when a code base and a deployment is two or three years old. 
and it's basically, we made a complete mess getting this up and running to the point where we made enough money to be able to afford to fix it, please help us fix it. So, you know, what you get is what you get. Um, so, the hostile environments become interesting. Um, so, I, in order to be able to do anything useful, you need zero install bootstrap. Um, because I, nothing else is going to be safe. And at this point, you go, but I want to be able to use CPAP. So, okay. Um, step zero towards being able to always use CPAM is local lib, which was actually me throwing a tantrum um, after about the 12th person that week on free node hash pearl saying, I can't use CPAM, I'm not root. You can install it to your home directory, here's how to configure cpam.pm. No, that's not what I said. Here's how to configure cpam.pm. No, I'm not. I eventually got, got tired of trying to explain it to people. Spent two days reading tool chain source code and discovered that actually, if you set these four environment variables, it all works. And that's local level. Um, and to be entirely honest, at the moment, local lib with Carton as a way to make sure that you always have the same versions you expect in it, is not a bad least worst solution available. There, there, were, there were a bunch of things wrong with it, but it exists and it works and the caveats are obvious. So, um, can, can, consider, consider this to be a, Carton annoys me because I know all of the things that can go wrong, but everything else annoys me more. Which, you know, it, it, from a system's point of view, is the closest to a recommendation you're ever going to get for anything, right? Um, but anyway, my continuing quest. So step one, app fat packer. Fat packer is fun. Um, basically, I got incredibly annoyed trying to get single file versions of scripts. Par does not count. I can never convince, talk anybody through configuring par so it actually works. I have trouble configuring par so it actually works. Um, so, alternative approach. Pull minus C the script. That gives you percent ink. So, okay, now you've got a list of modules loaded. That's not sufficient. <laughs> because distributions delay load parts of themselves. I mean, even up until relatively recently, carp did it. You had carp.pm and carp slash heavy.pm. So if you had carp from CPAN, if you only watched percent eight, you ended up with one and not the other. And lo and behold, nothing worked. Um, so, well, distributions install a dot pack list file. Um, yes, this does screw you if you're using distro packages because distro packages go, we already have all our mechanisms for doing this, let's not ship the standard one that all the build tools work with. Thank you very much, downstream. Um, but you can go from percent ink, find the pack list for that file, generate a file list from that, and then you've got a complete list of files that you're going to need. Um, at which point, well, I mean, your first thought is, well, let, let's just bolt them onto the front of the script in the order they're going to be required. But then, you know, again, the delay loading problem, depending on what code parts your code follows, you're going to need op files in different orders. So, instead, what we do is you create a hash of here documents that embeds all of the code, and then you stick a code rack in that ink. And your code ref, there should be a backslash on the front of that because what it's, what it's doing is opening a scalar reference file handle to it, at which point when you require foo slash bar.pm, it gets the contents of the here document. At which point all I have to do is bolt the code ref and the um, hash onto the front of the script and you have a complete self-contained script. Um, and in fact, at fat packer is why CPAN minus comes as a single file. Because um, Miyagawa had his own code for it and then went, hey, if I use mats, I don't have to maintain mine anymore and switch. And then I gave him a commit bit and he cried, but you know, <laughs> these things happen. Uh, <laughs> um, so, okay, that, that gets me as far as anything pure pearl, fixed set of dependencies I can bootstrap. That's nice. Doesn't work for access. <laughs> Generally, XS is either an optimization or a binding to a C library. 
If you need a binding to a C library, you already have the problem of getting the C library there. Um, so it turns out not to be that big a deal. Has resulted in Reba Sushi, myself, and a few other people maintaining pure Perl versions of this that would otherwise be only access. And the Perl is actually scarier than the C code, but it works. And it's still much less painful than Perl. Uh, that's a bad one to do. So, um, coming back to it, you still need a dependency tree to feed in. Um, the, the pack list approach is fine, but it brute force and it relies on you having already installed the dependencies. Um, and the, the thing that aggravates me is every single set of tooling on the planet seems to rely on gold version. You either have, I mean, you either have get latest from CPAN or get whatever the versions in the Debian repository are, or okay, Carton is get whatever versions are in my Carton.lock file which at least gives you per application gold version. But it's still not that interesting. And then, then you start exploring why it's like this. Um, and I, I came across a fascinating thing, the uh, Paul Graves Tube algorithm, um, which is in, I think, chapter 14 of On Less. Even, even if you don't write Common Less, I would recommend a skim through the book because it's got some fascinating ideas in it. Um, and you, you run into this problem, okay, X needs greater than 1.1 of that. So you go, what's the latest version? 1.12, so. And then Y needs greater than 1. Oh well, that's fine. And then you find out that there's a bug in 1.1.12 that makes Y not work. But you've already allocated 1.1.12 for X, so you need to be able to backtrack. Right? Um, and the choose algorithm does this by basically faking up continuations in common less. Um, which is not an unreasonable way of doing it, but uh, I thought it would be more fun to have a list with continuations so I didn't have to do that. So, there is an experimental list called Kernel. Yes, K-E-R-N-E-L. Yes, that was a stupid name for a programming language. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, but Kernel is what's known as an operative list. The fascinating thing about an operative list is that you don't get handed evaluated arguments. What you get handed instead is the expressions for your arguments and the lexical environment in which you can evaluate them if you want to. So you effectively get, get the full power of list macros at runtime as well as compile time. This is very cool and very good fun um, and very useful for prototyping. Hence why when I discovered somebody had implemented a fairly simple one in JavaScript, I ported it to Perl. Um, and then demonstrated that you can actually write JavaScript in Perl if you so desire. Um, what, what's, what's going on there, by the way, is um, the creates a derived environment for the evaluation, um, binds in the name, and I think, yeah, EP is the original environment, and then you push to the evaluation stage. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, what you can write with that, oh yes, and because I'm strange, I've used um, json -y, which is basically JSON without the syntax that Inge and I came up with, um, as the syntax for this, because it saved me writing an SX proposal. Um, so you, you, you can build something like this, and because um, it's an operative system, those um, symbols, the B, the R, the E, uh, are actually names, they're not evaluated through to values. So you can basically rewrite this into something that passes an environment down step by step. Um, and the thing is, if you're passing an environment down step by step, you can capture a continuation. If you can capture a continuation, what you do is, to, to, uh, EE is short for execution environment. When, when, you, when, you, when you're inside dependency solving, you're always trying to produce a working execution environment and typing that out. No. Um, if I wanted to be that verbose, I'd write job. Anyway, um, so the idea is, you check to see if there's already a clash. If you have a clash, then you merge it with the current, you merge the requirements with the current choice, which gets you to then resolve to the correct 1.1.11 instead of the buggy 12. Um, and clash restart is invoking 
at the limited continuation that jumps you back up to the point in the algorithm where you made the incorrect choice. At which point, the code continues on as if it made the right choice in the first place. If you're in a fresh, if you're in a, in a fresh choice situation, with restart, grabs the continuation, and then with build choice, is actually calling back through to an embedded Perl object that updates the um, collection for the execution environment. Because I wasn't doing the entire data structure stuff in less. No, boring. Anyway, um, so that works. Um, as is tradition with operative lists, however, because of the fact that they let you do everything at runtime, they have to do everything at runtime. This does not perform particularly well. You, you, you can watch the CPU peg for about a second every time it backtracks. Um, so I consider this to be an interesting proof of concept, but not particularly useful. Um, of course, there's bonus fun here as well. Which is, of course, meta.json is not normative. The requirements in there are guaranteed to be probably sort of something kind of like the final requirements. But if you rely on them for anything except generating an informational web page, you are screwed. Um, because dependencies will vary depending on operating system, Perl version, and so on. So you have to have my matter. Which means your dependencies depend on the configure environment. It means the only way to do this is to actually have a build system baked into the dependency resolver. So, um, I went through the cpan.pm sources. Did actually manage to patch it um, to the point where it mostly did what I wanted. Um, but cpan.pm is very much oriented around having a queue of things to build. And if you're in this situation, I've got basically, I've got basically a tree. Right? CPAN Plus, nicer architecture in a lot of ways, but it insists on recursing internally, which works fine with a tree, but then is fundamentally not parallelizable and very hard to control. So I'm like, okay, well, there is a third option, and then Miyagawa decided that supporting plugins for CPAN Minus was too much work, deleted the entire plugin interface and declared it a black box. So that stopped being an option there. Uh, I have to say, my, my current conclusion to that is, nuts to it, I'll deal with that when everything else works. Uh, <laughs> so, in the meantime, this is over the course of like several years, um, I ended up with this fascinating problem. We had a customer whose infrastructure was a bunch of random um, Amazon Web Services EC2 machines deployed by a sole developer who could not sysadmin his way out of a paper bag who was no longer with the company. So they had no idea what their production platform was actually running. At which point, I'm in a situation where I want to be able to run lots of different probes. Having to fat pack every time is just, it's just going to get too much like hard work, right? Fat pack is fine for one script you're going to run lots of times, that's why it works beautifully for CPAN miners. But it's not so good for ad hoc systems tooling. Um, so effectively what I want is automatic fat packing, but I don't want to have to think about it. How do I end up not thinking about it? <coughs> I wrote a thing called Object Remote. Object Remote, you can say new colon colon on. What that does is actually dispatches to the method on in the namespace new, at which point Object Remote takes over, opens up a connection to the remote host, and you get a proxy back. So what it actually does is SSHs to the host, runs Perl dash, at which point Perl is waiting for the script on Stade, yeah? So at that point, you shove your fat pack version of yourself across the wire and then send it underscore underscore n. Because n says to Perl, script is done, you can stop parsing now. At which point, it gives me stud in back. So I can reuse stud in and stud out as my communications channel. So at that point, we go, okay, we did that dollar object is a proxy object. It has an auto load method that takes the method name and it's got a reference to the connection, internally, collapses all of the arguments to JSON, ships them over the wire to the other end. 
um, all based around um, Paul Evans's future.pm, which is, um, if, if you're trying to do event-driven code, look at IO8 Sync. IO8 Sync with futures is so much less painful than any other approach. Um, so it creates a future, assigns an ID to it, sends the method call and the future ID, at which point the other end can churn for as long as it likes, and then sends the line of JSON back with the result of the computation. So you, you can run these multiply in parallel. But if you're only doing something simple, then I've got an await all subroutine that basically goes block until this is done. Um, that, of course, has to be backed by a spin loop. The thing is, because I'm trying to hide the async stuff under the hood when you're not caring about async, it has to be a re-entrance spin loop. That's when it gets fun, because what you have to do, basically, is create a list that you're waiting for, um, and then only when the top future um, on the stack is finished, at that point you can stop the loop. Um, you can't just do it when another one is, because the point is it has, you know, if you have loop waiting, loop waiting inside that, loop waiting inside that, this one has to return first. So you, you do, so you, which is why you need the local, and that makes it operate successfully re Um we, we managed to break this quite hard um, doing massively parallel runs of it at one point. Um, the current version actually works. Um, and then you can just return the value from the future. All fine. Um, so the goal of all of this is now I'm putting an object in that ink. Because, you know, having an object and a code rack in that ink is just funny. Right? Doing that, you can then have a hook object. You have to fully qualify the method now. Because Ink is a special symbol in Perl. If it sees it on its own, it's always forced into package main, even if it's sub-ink. Um, so at which point, you ask for some code, and then do the open a file handle to it. Gem one of those into that ink, sort it. Question now is, where do we get the code from? We get the code by making an object remote call back to the host, because we're re-entering the protocols too back. At which point the host scans through its ink, and if it finds the file, ships the source code across. Which means that I can treat any PRPL module that's installed on the master host that I'm SSHing from as if it's installed on all of the remote systems. Which means all I need is PIL 581 plus um, and an SSH connection to any of these machines. Um, and I can then run whatever probes I want to and manage to gather data and pull it back to an operations box to figure out what's going on. And it, it was, um, so at that point, you know, you pull things like username lists, contacts, packages, processes, net stat, information. Um, and the, the first week live was a huge success. Um, we found two missing services that production was dependent on that were not documented anywhere, and one botnet. <laughs> yeah. The botnet is now gone, happily. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> but we, 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 we still track to make track things like process lists, package lists to make sure everything's kept in sync across all of the machines. So if any of the systems automation tooling that's updating stuff has a bad day and doesn't do the right thing, the introspection code, which is completely independent, will pick it up and tell us it went wrong. Um, anyway, so um, go back to the choose algorithm. Choose was inspired by Pro. Um, prologue. Prologue is interesting. Um, the, the thing about prologue is it, it's all about predicates. Um, it, it's a logic programming language which is close to declarative but not quite. Prologue is, is, is a beautiful design in that it's just procedural enough that you can work out what it's doing 
um, as opposed to most uh, sort of sat solvers and similar, where they're a black box, you feed in some input and you either get an output or nothing. Um, but the neat, the neat thing about Bolo is, a predicate like that can be interpreted in multiple ways. So if you run it with server value to a value, but package free, that will return once per package installed on the server. So package list for a server. You run the same thing with package bound but not server. You get a list of all servers that package is installed. Run it with both bounds, you get a true or false, is this installed on this machine? So that, that model looked kind of interesting. Um, because of the idea of, of expressing truth, so you can basically talk about is this my desired state and what is the current state? Um, but Prolog does have a kind of odd syntax in a lot of respects. And you know, I, I'm saying odd syntax from the point of view of being a Perl programmer, right? <laughs> um, so obviously, I, 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 I want to be able to build something that's a reasonable declarative interface for sysadmins to work with. Um, and ni ni 1970s French logic programming is probably not the optimal UI. So, obviously, the only thing to do was to pull in even more strange and ugly languages. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, TCL, TCL is awesome because it's basically a list made out of strings. <laughs> the point at which I realised I was going to like TCL was the point at which I got half an hour into using it, got annoyed that it didn't have an unless keyword, and managed to implement one in pure TCL in about 20 minutes. Um, because TCL basically braces in TCL are its single quote character. So what happens is the um, body just gets passed through as an argument to your subroutine. So you run the test and either reval the body or don't. Uh, I mean, under the hood, once you've treated a particular string as code, it caches the code representation. So it, it's not the horribly slow it sounds like. Um, but that basically allows you to meta-program using strings. It's actually quite a fun language to script in. Um, I, I found myself more and more um, breaking out TCL for simple things, simply because while I could write it in Perl, I spent so much time doing large-scale, object-oriented applications Perl, it's quite hard to shift my brain to do good scripting Perl. Whereas if I switch to a different language, I'm not quite as incompetent. Um, anyway, so I had this idea of basically a, a prologue-inspired solver. Um, so the, the idea of that is that you express things by saying, okay, an environment satisfies a requirement if there exists some build such that that build can satisfy the requirement and the build is available in the environment. Yeah, so you, you basically, they, they, this allows you to do the two-step resolution that, because distro packaging things always work on package name, and of course CPAN has requirements independent of distribution, so you need the difference. Um, and then transitive dependencies become relatively easy to handle, because all you have to do uh, is say for each transitive requirement, um, basically what, um, the prolog system will do is it will recurse all possibilities of requirement of, and then recurse through looking to satisfy them. At which point you get the you get the roll forwards down the dependency tree approach. And because prolog is logic programming, the backtracking concept is already built in. So the whole oh that choice was bad, I need to go back is just a property of the language. Um, okay, so the end result from um, a prologue is you either get, here is a set of values for which your original request was true, or it says no. That's insufficient. The solver I'm working on can also respond with maybe. This is systems, the answer is always maybe, right? <laughs> um, more precisely, it's not so much false as false but. The idea being, this is currently false, but if you take these actions, it will be true. So for example, is the package installed on the server? Your choice, your responses are either going to be true or, or false, but if I install it, then it will be true. 
Um, so you can actually produce possible solutions. Um, so you, what you effectively get out is not just a set of values, but possibly a list of actions to be taken to make those values valid. Um, going from that, you, you then end up with, with the values for the result, but a projected result after the actions are taken. So, you know, if, if you say, you know, do I have Apache on this machine? It's going to say the answer will be yes after I run out get install Apache. Um, the problem you then get into is how to model that. Because you obviously don't want this thing going away and starting installing things when you're just checking. Um, but which point? Well, uh, well what's, what's the obvious place to deal with state measurements? Let's steal some ideas from Haskell. Um, because, I mean, if you think that the basic principle of a monad is that you have a world state. And so you say, you know, the new world is the result of applying some function to the old world. And that allows you to interleave state through without compromising functional purity. In this case, what we need to do is basically make sure the system always backs on to a view of the world that we control, at which point we can model actions as expected new world is the result of applying the function. So it, it says, if I run up get install Apache, I expect the world to be the same, except Apache will be installed on this machine. And then after, if you actually tell it to do it, it can go back and recheck. Um, so the, the idea is you basically solve, run, resolve. Um, each time you get a list of actions, some of them are dependent on others. Like if you're creating a file in a directory and the directory isn't there yet, the file creation actually is dependent on the directory, so you have to run the directory creation, and then you, re you loop back through. This is meant to be a sysadmin tool. I am not having it trust itself. I know who wrote that code, it was me. That's not good. Um, so you basically keep, keep rerunning the solver until you end up with no outstanding actions. So in order to test this out, I wrote myself an SSH key manager. Um, so you basically describe rules. This, this is actually a copy and paste from running code. Um, so the SSH on an account, it finds the home directory, declares that a directory should exist in it called .ssh and declares the map. Right? Um, home near on? Okay, home near on is... That's a random remote account. Well, I already solved that problem. All I have to do is write something that works locally and then ship it across the wire with object remote. <laughs> um, the, the other key trick is the VM for all of this is pure continuation passing style. So the state of the computation at any point is always encapsulated in a continuation. That then means that rather than prologues traditionally use a thing called the choice point, which basically records how to roll back a variable assignment. Um, if you don't mind burning some RAM, and in, in this sort of situation, memory is not a great expense. It's a lot easier to just carry a version of the world with the modifications already applied. Um, and again, that fits in nicely with the monadic style. The other trick is that means that when you get halfway through and find you don't have a piece of information, you can invoke a wonderful thing called return multi level. Basically, um, if you've ever used used exceptions for flow control. Return multi-level is like that, except not horrible. <laughs> um, return multi-level takes advantage of the fact that Perl labels are dynamically scoped, jensens up a label name, stashes that away behind the code ref, and then basically from the point of the return multi-level, if your four function calls did, when you invoke that code ref, it does a go-to to that label, because the label's dynamically scoped, it always finds the right one, fiddles with the return value, and returns from the original spot. So from four layers deep inside the solver, I can basically do return to top, here's a continuation, here's the thing you need to run that affects the world before the continuation will be run. Um, 
So that, that then gives you the ability to basically break out of the solver loop and be able to do multiple parallel actions and then go back into solving. So you can now your set of values and actions. Um, so initially, um, that's going to return the create direct reaction if the .sh isn't there. If it's there but the permissions are wrong, you'll get a chmod direct reaction. Um, and because it always has to return the actions to the top level, um, you can always see what it's going to do before it does it. So then, you know, authorized keys becomes a fairly similar thing. And I can say, is a key installed on this? Does the authorized keys file exist? Does it contain the right lock? But at the same time, that code not only represents testing if the key's installed, but because there are compensation actions attached to if any of those fail, it can produce the actions for make directory and write file. So you, you effectively get SSH copy ID style behavior built in. Um, the fun part is that I can build the configuration out of the same thing. Um, just say, find me the appropriate config file, what lines are in the config file. Um, so you then end up with a system with three modes. Query, which is pure true false. Solve, which is allowed to go false but. And ensure, which is going back to my original thing, which is basically figure out the actions to take to make this correct. Run the actions and then double check it all actually worked. Um, so at that point, you basically go to test, are all of my SSH keys installed on a remote machine? You're just writing that, and no key key reads from a local file. Um, built on top of this one set of rules, I have status, which just reports all keys installed. Um, sync, which goes and installs whatever keys are missing from whatever machines they're missing from. But notably, because of the action model, I've got sync minus n. I'll uh, make minus n. The system can always produce a dry run, um, which is something that really annoys me about a lot of tools. Um, in that I really hate it when I tweak a config file, and the only way to figure out if it's going to deploy the right thing is to run a test deployment on the staging machine. Um, so that's kind of slow. I want to figure out that I've screwed up much quicker than that, thank you. Um, so sync is pretty much literally solve for all keys installed. Well, minus n is, and then you switch it over to ensure mode to actually do the work. Um, which brings us back to this. So at this point, the idea of a build that can satisfy a requirement might be a pre-existing binary build, or we might have to go away and build one. Um, the transitive requirement problem and that tracking is already built in. Um, and the result is going to be either install an existing package or install the result of building a package. And because these are just actions that each have the projected result of, the package is available, none of the rest of the logic needs to care about the fact that you're supporting source and binary builds in parallel, um, which I'm hoping is going to allow me to add multiple additional sources for builds, like, say, you know, if there's already a package in a Debian repository and you'd rather use that, and get installed that package is, it's just a different action that makes the information available. Um, so the sort of current state of this is the TCL DSL works. Um, the CBS solver call, the reason I'm not showing you much of that um, is because I really, 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 really want to rewrite it once more before the rest of the world looks at the code. Um, but all of the hard parts now basically work. What remains comes into the simple matter of programming category. Um, if you want to have a look, uh, that's tiny, I know. Uh, uh, dkit.git on git.shadowcat.co.uk has my current work in progress. Um, including the key manager. I am actually using the key manager um, because I figured the sooner I started dog fooding, the better things would be. And um, hopefully that contains some interesting ideas. Next year I will have something actually deployable. 
Thank you very much. Given I believe we are out of time, might I propose that we do questions in the form of I am going to go through into the canteen and sit down with a coffee, but if you want to ask me things, please feel free. <laughs>